to you watching this welcome to or welcome back to the liability youtube channel where i brie cheyenne mostly talk about unsolved crimes against children anything from older to newer now i know i usually keep my intros pretty short but this one is going to be a couple minutes long because i do have a few things i want to say the last video i made i was thanking you guys for like 400 subscribers and now i've passed 5,000. That is absolutely insane and I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who has recently subscribed. I'm so happy you guys enjoyed my content enough to do that. But I also don't want to forget about the people who have been subscribed so of course thank you guys for all of you that have stayed subscribed as well. Now the next thing I want to address really quickly is the style of this video. It is different than the normal videos I've posted. Usually I add like pictures and music on top of me talking, but in this video it's actually just going to be like a straight podcast style type video. Now wait, wait, before you click off, hold on. If this isn't your jam, hold on. I just want to say something really quickly. <laughs> For these types of videos that I do upload, if you don't want to sit here and watch it as a YouTube video, I'm also going to start uploading them on podcast servers. Oh, excuse me on podcast servers so like apple spotify things like that even free ones like audio mac so if you don't have a subscription to those you can still listen if you don't want to watch it as a youtube video i do enjoy making the normal videos i do with like the pictures and music well this one still has music the only thing different is that there's no picture and video like there usually is i do enjoy making those types of videos but i do also enjoy making these podcasts I know with myself, I'm not someone who likes to watch or consume the same type of uh, media over and over. Like sometimes I like to listen to things while I'm doing something. Sometimes I like to sit down and watch something. Sometimes I want to watch something shorter. Sometimes I want to watch something longer. So I just wanted to provide that variety with my content because I'm sure I'm not the only person. By the time I upload this video, I should have it um, as a link for a podcast by the time I upload it. But if not, check back in a few days and I definitely will by then. And the last thing I wanted to say, this isn't that serious, but <laughs> I've recorded this at like different times. This wasn't all recorded at once. So like I remember at one part I was like really tired, but I was like, I'm going to just keep going. And y'all, y'all going to hear me say some things that just sound kind of weird. I re-recorded, um, did like voiceovers over a few parts. So I just want to say you might hear the audio sound a little different in some parts because I like recorded over it because I was just sounding I was like what did I even just say then so yeah <laughs> but without further ado I'm gonna go ahead and jump into today's case between 1968 and 1969 a serial killer murdered at least five known victims in Northern California and just downright terrorized the area the case gained notoriety for the many taunting letters and ciphers he sent to the police and these letters is where the name originated and one wasn't decrypted until within the last couple of years. This is the case of the Zodiac Killer, also known as Zodiac and the Zodiac. Despite the Zodiac having claimed to have killed 37 people, the police mainly focused on only seven confirmed victims, five of which were killed and the remaining two injured. And those are the victims I'm mostly going to focus on today. The first two confirmed victims of the Zodiac are 17-year-old David Faraday and 16-year-old Betty Lou Jensen in Benicia, California. Born on October 2, 1951, Faraday was the son of Thomas Faraday, an employee for the Pacific Gas and Electric. He had a good head on his shoulders, being described as a good student, a boy scout, an athlete, and just an overall friendly, handsome boy. He soon found himself dating Betty Lou Jensen, a talented artist and popular student. She was born on July 22, 1951 in Hawkins, Colorado to Vincent M. Johnson, who was a programmer for the U.S. General Services Administration. Their two-week relationship started arousing some jealousy within another boy that liked Jensen and who decided to confront Faraday. This did cause an argument between the boys, but Faraday did not let that deter his and Jensen's relationship, and he decided he was going to take her on their first official date. It was December 20th, 1968, and the couple initially had talks about going to a Christmas event being held at their high school. 
They promised Jensen's parents they would be back by 11 p.m., but the couple didn't actually go to the Christmas event. Barring a rambler owned by Faraday's mother, they instead visited a friend, then drove to a local restaurant before going out to Lake Herman Road, a well-known lover's lane. Shortly after 11 p.m., their bodies were discovered by a nearby resident named Stella Borge... Borge... We're gonna call her Stella B. Upon arriving at the scene, investigators noticed that the Rambler's passenger door was open, which is where Jensen would have been sitting. A bullet had penetrated the roof of the vehicle, and another bullet passed through the back window. A total of 10 shell casings were found around the crime scene. Robert Graysmith had a theory as to what exactly happened that night. Graysmith is a true crime author and former cartoonist, famously known for his work on the Zodiac Killer. His 1968 book, Zodiac, is the basis for the popular 2007 movie with the same name. He hypothesized that just prior to 11 p.m., another car pulled into Lake Herman Road and parked beside the couple. His theory continues that the killer exited his car, walked to the Rambler, and proceeded to order the couple out of the car. After Jensen exited the car, Faraday was shot in his head while he was getting out. Jensen was shot five times in her back, and her body was found 28 feet from the car, meaning she likely attempted to flee. Afterwards, the killer drove off. Now, this doesn't mean much to me because I have no idea what this means, but I'm just going to say it for, you know, if someone watching this is interested in guns and does know what this means. <laughs> Forensic evidence identified the ammunition as a Winchester Western Super X copper coated that was used with a 22 caliber, possibly a J.C. Higgins model 80 semi-automatic pistol. The Solano County Sheriff's Department investigated the murders, but they weren't able to develop any substantial leads. One lead they looked into was a marijuana dealer Faraday had a previous altercation with. Faraday supposedly threatened to report his activities to the police, but investigation into that didn't link him to the murders. A man named Bill Crow and his girlfriend were parked in the same place as Faraday and Jensen 45 minutes earlier than they were. They reported to police that someone in a white Chevy drove past them, stopped, and then backed up. Crow was absolutely not having it and immediately sped away in the opposite direction, causing the Chevy to follow the couple, but they lost them after Crow made a sharp right turn at an intersection. Two hunters also reported seeing a white Chevy parked at a gravel turnaround on Lake Herman Road. They didn't see a driver inside after approaching this car. Investigators believe the two teenagers were likely just random victims simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. By the time they were found, Betty Lou Jensen was already dead and Faraday was dying. He was unresponsive and died on his way to the hospital. Funeral services were held for both Betty Lou Jensen and David in Vallejo, California. Jensen was buried at Skyview Memorial Lawn while Faraday was cremated. The case went cold for months until the killer struck again in Vallejo, California on what should have been a joyous American holiday. Just before midnight on July 4th, 1969, 22-year-old Darlene Farron and her 19-year-old friend Michael Majo pulled into the parking lot of Blue Rock Springs Golf Course in Vallejo, California. Born on March 17, 1947 in Oakland, California, Farron was married, a mother, and worked as a waitress at Terry's Restaurant. Majo was single and had a job as a laborer. The two intended to drive to Mr. Ed's diner, but they decided to go to Blue Rock Springs instead. They sat in Farron's Brown Corvair, just four miles from where Faraday and Jensen's murders had occurred seven months prior. While talking, three vehicles pulled up to where Farron and Majo were parked. A few young kids that set off some fireworks had some laughs, but they otherwise didn't stay for very long. Not long after the group left, a separate car pulled in, stopped behind Farron's car for a moment, and then drove off. The same car returned minutes later, this time parking. The driver exited the vehicle and began approaching Farron's car with a flashlight. Who Farron and Majo thought was a police officer was actually a man coming to take their lives. The driver walked to the passenger side of the car where Majo sat and pointed a gun through the car window. 
The gunman said absolutely nothing and almost immediately began firing several shots, first shooting Majo and then Farron. He proceeded to walk back to his car, but not before coming back to shoot them several more times after hearing Majo cry out. Like, like he wanted to make sure they were dead. The attacker then got back into his car and drove away. He later used the payphone at a gas station just blocks away from the Vallejo Police Department and had the audacity, the audacity to call the police station. When police dispatcher Nancy Slover answered, she recalls the caller spoke in a low monotonous tone. He said, I want to report a murder. If you will go one mile east on Columbus Parkway, you will find kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9mm Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. This call was received at 12.40 a.m. Majo and Farron were both shot with a 9mm handgun, just like the caller said, and were found still alive by three teenagers just minutes after their attack. After the teens went to get help, Farron and Majo were transported to the hospital where Farron died en route and Majo actually survived. Both were hit several times and Majo survived wounds to his jaw, shoulder, and leg. The 911 dispatcher, Nancy Slover, estimated the man to be at least 30 years old based on his voice. Majo was only able to give a limited description of the car because it was dark, saying it appeared to be of a similar shape to Farron's Corvair and a similar color, possibly a bit of a lighter brown. He was able to catch that the license plate came from California, but not any distinct numbers or letters. He believes the gun had a silencer because the shots sounded quite muffled. They weren't very loud. Majo was able to describe the gunman when interviewed by Vallejo police detective Ed Rust. According to Majo's police statement, the suspect was, quote, short, possibly 5'8", was real heavy set, beefy build, not blubbery fat, but real beefy, possibly 195 to 200 pounds, or maybe even larger. Majo also stated that he had short curly hair, light brown, almost blonde, with a large face. Majo noted the killer didn't have a mustache and was wearing a blue shirt, but he wasn't sure if it was light blue or dark blue. He was shown photographs of various people, but he was unable to identify any possible suspects. He also wasn't able to tell detectives any people who would have wanted to harm him or Farron. Majo was quite confident that he and Farron were close enough that she would have told him if something was up between her and someone else. After the call the killer made to the police department, Vallejo police now realized the two attacks were connected. Three weeks after the last attack, three separate envelopes were received from the killer by the Vallejo Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the San Francisco Examiner, all postmarked July 31st, 1969. Each envelope contained a handwritten letter with three parts of a coded message split up into each letter. The letters claimed responsibility for both attacks and also divulged information about the Blue Rock Springs attack that only the killer would know. This included the ammunition used, how many shots were fired, and the position of Farron and Mago's bodies. He threatened to kill again, writing, quote, if you do not print this cipher by the afternoon of Friday, August 1st, 1969, I will go on a kill rampage Friday night. I will cruise around all weekend, killing lone people in the night, then move on to kill again until I end up with a dozen people over the weekend, end quote. The wording varied slightly from each letter, but overall they were pretty close to identical. All three parts were eventually published, fortunately, no murders attributed to the Zodiac occurred that weekend. In an attempt to get the killer to send more information, an article printed by the Chronicle alongside the cipher quoted the Vallejo police chief Jack E. Stiltz as saying, quote, We're not satisfied that the letter was written by the murderer, end quote, and requested that the writer send a second letter with more facts to prove his identity. The plan worked and the killer sent another letter to the examiner that was received on August 4th, 1969. In this letter, the writer started off saying, quote, Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking, end quote. Thus, the pseudonym The Zodiac was born. 
Zodiac included more information in this letter, corrected some incorrect information that was spreading around in the news, and also alluded that his identity was hidden in the ciphers, known as the 408 cipher or Z408 for the amount of characters. It was solved a week later on August 8th, 1969 by husband and wife Donald Jean and Betty June Harden of Salinas, California. They spent over 20 hours working on it. The Vallejo Police Department received a call on August 8, 1969 from George Murphy at the Chronicle, who informed them that the Hardens had broken the code and sent their work to the Chronicle, which was retrieved by police later that day. The cipher did not reveal the Zodiac's identity, but instead included his crazy ramblings about how he liked killing because it's so much fun and that he wouldn't give police his name because they would try to stop him. The 408 cipher was independently solved by the FBI in Washington who corroborated the Hardin solution. The murders were outside of federal jurisdiction and the FBI's role then remains much the same as it does today, aiding local law enforcement. They've been able to provide resources such as handwriting analysis, cryptanalysis, and fingerprint analysis. Farron's husband, Dean, was looked into as a possible suspect, but was ruled out when they discovered he had an alibi, having been at work. Her first husband was also briefly investigated, but he too was eliminated as a suspect. Darlene was buried at Sunrise Memorial Center in Vallejo, California. The investigation continued without any real leads, but the Zodiac struck again a couple months later. A pair of old friends were enjoying a day at Lake Berryessa in Napa County on September 27, 1969. College students Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were picnicking and reminiscing on old times when they were approached by a man with a gun, which Hartnell believed to be a 45. He was a white man, about 5 feet 11 inches tall, weighing more than 170 pounds with combed, greasy brown hair. He was wearing a black executioner type hood with clip-on glasses over eye holes and a bit like device on his chest that had a white cross circle symbol on it. This cross circle, which if you're familiar with the Zodiac case, you are probably familiar with the symbol, would become the marked symbol of the Zodiac. The man claimed to be an escaped convict from a jail in Montana where he says he killed a guard and subsequently stole a car, but now he needed their car and money to go to Mexico as the vehicle he had been driving was now too hot. He gave them a two word name, I'm assuming it definitely was not a real one, which Hartnell recalled as quote, Fernlock or something, end quote, according to his police statement. Shepard was forced to tie Hartnell up, which she did quite loosely, because the Zodiac said he would feel better if he was tied up. Zodiac discovered how loose she tied him up and he tightened the ligatures himself. Hartnell attempted to defuse the situation. In fact, they all talked for quite a bit of time, but the ordeal continued as the Zodiac tied up Shepard. The Zodiac opted not to shoot these two, but instead pulled out a foot long knife and stabbed them multiple times. That honestly actually sounds worse. Hartnell and Shepard suffered six and ten stab wounds respectively. They were found by a father and a son who were fishing nearby and called police for help. Shepard was still conscious when authorities arrived and was able to give a description of the attacker before being taken to the hospital. Unfortunately, she lapsed into a coma on her way there and passed away two days later. Hartnell survived and was able to give police a detailed account of the vicious attack. After the attack, the Zodiac walked to Hartnell's car and used a black marker to draw his cross circle symbol on one of the doors. Below that, he wrote the dates of the previous two attacks and added the notation, quote, September 27, 1969, 6.30 p.m. by knife, end quote. Since he knew what car Hartnell had, it's likely he had been following them or at least watching out. The Napa Police Department received a call at 7.40 p.m. answered by Officer David Slate. The caller spoke in the same low monotonous tone as the previous call saying, I want to report a murder, no, a double murder. They are two miles north of park headquarters. They were in a white Volkswagen Carmen Gia, end quote. 
Slate asked the man to provide his location, but he only replied with, I'm the one who did it. The payphone from which the call was made still had the phone off the hook and detectives were able to lift a palm print from it, but they were unable to match it to anyone. Additionally, the payphone was only blocks away from the police department, but 27 miles from the crime scene. That's absolutely insane. Like, this man definitely had an obsession with the police. Shepard was buried at St. Helena Cemetery in Napa County, California. Investigators from Benencia, Vallejo, and Napa started cooperating to develop any leads while the Zodiac claimed his next and last definitive victim two weeks later. On October 11th, 1969, the Zodiac made a bold attack on a cab driver while riding passenger in San Francisco, California. Born on December 18, 1939 in Exeter, California, 28-year-old Paul Stein was a student, loving husband, and a yellow cab driver. On that October night, he began his night shift expecting to return home to his wife after finishing. Unbeknownst to him, he would pick up a passenger that night who already decided his fate. Stein picked up a white male passenger that was requesting to go to an upscale neighborhood known as Presidio Heights. Hope I pronounced that correctly. For reasons unknown, Stein drove past the street he was to stop at, where from there he was shot in the back of his head. Just before 10 p.m., three teenagers in the area saw the scuffle and reported to police as seeing a man walk away from the cab after wiping parts of it off with a handkerchief and going through Stein's pockets. The man took Stein's wallet, keys, and part of his bloodstained shirt, which he uses for later. Patrol officers Don Fook and Eric Zelms were two blocks away from the crime scene and were the ones to respond to the call. En route to the scene, they saw a white man that fit the Zodiac's description walking along the sidewalk and into the yard of a home. However, the police radio dispatcher said that the suspect was black, thus they never stopped him. The official suspect description described him as white between 35 to 45 years old, 5'8", with reddish brown hair and a crew cut, wearing heavy rim glasses, and a navy blue or black jacket. Stein's murder was initially believed to be a robbery gone bad, but that changed when the San Francisco Chronicle received a letter postmarked October 13, 1969, three days after the murder. In this letter, the writer identified themselves as the Zodiac and claimed responsibility for Stein's murder. To prove his claims, he included a piece of his bloodstained shirt that he took from his body. He also mocked police for failing to catch him that night and threatened to kill children by shooting up a school bus, saying, quote, school children make nice targets. I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning, end quote, sicko. The letter was signed with the Zodiac cross circle symbol. The three team witnesses were able to work with police to develop a composite sketch of the man they saw. This was amended to account for other witness descriptions and the sketch was circulated to the press. Detective Bill Armstrong and Dave Toshi were assigned to the case after this murder. The San Francisco Police Department investigated an estimated 2,500 suspects over a period of years. Despite that, the killer has still remained at large. On October 22, 1969, a caller claiming to be the Zodiac contacted the Oakland Police Department and demanded famous defense lawyers F. Lee Bailey and Melvin Belly go on air on the Jim Dunbar talk show. Only Belly appeared on the show as Bailey was unavailable. During this, a call from the supposed Zodiac came in. He said his real name was Sam and asked that Belly meet him in Dolly City. Belly agreed, but the Sam never showed. It was later discovered that the calls were made by an imposter, a mental patient at Napa State Hospital. The Chronicle received two envelopes from the Zodiac in the following weeks, postmarked November 8th and 9th, 1969. The first envelope contained a greeting card and another cipher consisting of 340 symbols. The cipher became known as Z340 or 340 cipher. The writer added December, July, August, September, October equals seven. 
possibly making a reference to more victims unknown to authorities. The second envelope contained a six page long letter in which the Zodiac claimed that the police stopped him only minutes after he shot Stein. He says the officers asked if he saw any suspicious people and subsequently let him go. Now, the only officers responding to the call of Paul Stein's murder were Fook and Zounds. Zounds was unfortunately killed in the line of duty on January 1st, 1970. May he rest in peace. But Fook has denied the Zodiac's version of what happened that night. First doing so in a memo he wrote the same day the first envelope was received. The Zodiac stated that his appearance when he's committing murders is actually a facade and that he did not leave fingerprints as police said. The latter of which he specified that he has a method to prevent that, two coats of airplane cement on his fingertips. Zodiac also included a bomb recipe with a drawn diagram of how the explosion would occur. On the one year anniversary of the Zodiac's first murders of Betty Lou Jensen and David Faraday, Attorney Martin Belly received a letter from the Zodiac on December 20th, 1969. He got played last time, but this time it was actually the Zodiac. In this letter, the Zodiac expressed fear of losing control again and taking his ninth or possibly 10th victim. He included another piece of Stein's shirt and asked Belly for his help. The letter ended with him saying, please help me, I cannot remain in control for much longer. Belly attempted to get the Zodiac to contact him again to no avail. Would the Zodiac's fears be realized? On the evening of March 22nd, 1970, 22-year-old Kathleen Johns had just set on a trip with her 10-month-old daughter from San Bernardino, California with the intention of driving to Petaluma to visit her sick mother. Johns was also 7 months pregnant at the time. While she was driving, a car behind her started honking its horn and flashing its headlights almost as if to signal something was wrong. Johns pulled off to the side of the road and stopped her car. The driver of the car behind her, a man, approached her car and told her that one of her back tires was wobbling, probably from lug nuts. He even offered to tighten them for her. Johns accepted and after finishing, the man drove away. Almost immediately, John's tire fell off when she attempted to drive back onto the highway. Suddenly, the man reappeared, this time offering to drive her and her daughter to a nearby gas station for some help, to which John's accepted. He had no intention of ever driving them to a gas station and spent the next 90 minutes driving around. When he finally stopped at an intersection, a scared John saw her chance. She leapt out of the car with her daughter and proceeded to hide in a field. The man searched and searched for them with the flashlight, but he eventually gave up. Johns was able to hitch a ride and was brought to a nearby police station in Patterson, California around 2.30 a.m. As Johns was providing her statement to the police, she became hysterical and pointed to the amended composite sketch of the Zodiac, saying he was the man who had just abducted her and her daughter hours earlier. When asked if she had ever seen him before, she said no. Her car was later located and it had been completely incinerated. For the remainder of 1970, the Zodiac continued to communicate through multiple letters. One month after the failed abduction, the Chronicle received a letter postmarked April 20th, 1970. The Zodiac stated in the beginning part of the letter, my name is, followed by a 13 character cipher. He denied being the perpetrator of a bomb attack that killed a sergeant in Golden State Park a few months prior. It also included another diagram of the bomb he said he would use to blow up a school bus. He claimed that his number of victims was now at 10. He signed the letter with his symbol equals 10, SFPD equals zero. SFPD presumably referring to the San Francisco Police Department. The Chronicle also received a greeting card postmarked April 28th, 1970. There was a note that said, quote, I hope you enjoy yourselves when I have my blast, end quote, followed by the Zodiac's cross circle symbol. On the back of the card, the Zodiac threatened to use the bus bomb soon unless the newspaper did two things. First, he wanted the full details of what he intended to do with the bus bomb published. He also wanted to start seeing people wearing some nice Zodiac buttons. I'm sorry, why does that, like, this makes me laugh every time I see, like, why, why, what would make him think people would start doing it? This man was so delusional. <laughs> 
Two months later, he sent a letter to the Chronicle postmarked June 26, 1970. He complained that no one was walking around wearing the zodiac buttons like he requested. <laughs> like, of course not. Included in this was a map with a code, both of which should be used in conjunction to figure out the location of an apparent bomb, he said. I'm going to mention a Mount Diablo code in a minute or two, and this is the bomb I was talking about. The Zodiac gave them until fall to find this location. As far as I know, this attack never occurred. He also claimed to have shot a man sitting in a parked car with a 38 revolver. He could have possibly been referring to the murder of Sergeant Richard Radetich, who was shot a week earlier while writing a parking ticket. An unrelated suspect shot him in the head with a 38 caliber pistol and Radetich died 15 hours later. There were a few witnesses to the crime, but statements offered at the time were contradictory. Within weeks of the shooting, a potential suspect, an ex-convict from Ohio, was identified, arrested, and charged, but those charges were later dropped due to insufficient evidence. The San Francisco Police Department denies the Zodiac was involved with the shooting, again due to insufficient evidence. By this time, he wrote his victim count was now at 12. One month after this letter, the Chronicle received two more postmarked letters for July 24th and 26th, 1970. In both letters, he again expressed disdain that no one was walking around wearing his Zodiac symbol buttons. When I read this, I couldn't help but think about that scene from Mean Girls with Fetch, like, when Regina yells at Gretchen, like, stop trying to make Fetch happen, it's not going to happen. Like, what? That's exactly what I thought about. The second letter was a five-page letter that included a rambling threat of torturing his slaves in paradise if they didn't start wearing his buttons. It also included a hint for the Mount Diablo code, saying it concerned geometric angles known as radians. Now, this code hasn't been officially solved from what I know, but there have been many theories and possibilities. In 1987, Zodiac enthusiast Garrett Penn penned a theory, Garrett Penn penned a theory, love that, known as the Radiant Theory in his book, Time 17. Penn theorizes that the Zodiac intentionally chose his crime scenes to create what's called a Radian. However, there have been disagreements with this theory because Penn's placement of the crime scenes is incorrect to where they actually occurred, which kind of <laughs> just blows the whole theory up if you're not even using the correct locations. Another website called ZodiacCyphers.com claimed that the Zodiac Code revealed that the bomb was at Ingleside Police Station. Now, y'all, I don't understand the math at all, but for some reason, I believe this one. Simply because it seems like the police were the Zodiac's chosen nemesis. It's like, I mean, like I said earlier, he was just obsessed with them. I really feel like half of his fun, quote, fun, was really seeing the police run on a wild goose chase trying to figure out who he was. I'm not going to go all into that theory because, again, like I said, I don't understand the math. But if you want to read about that, I'm going to have the link to that in the description box. Another possible victim of the Zodiac was a woman named Donna Laz who went missing from South Lake Tahoe, California in September of 1970. Born in Sioux Falls, South Dakota in 1944, 25-year-old Lass always had the goal of becoming a nurse. In her senior interview, she stated that her plans were to go to college or be a nurse. In May of 1970, she worked in San Francisco where she was employed at Letterman General Hospital located on the Presidio military base. This hospital was not far from the area where the Zodiac claimed Paul Stein's life. Lass would eventually move to South Lake Tahoe where she was a nurse for the Sahara Tahoe, now known as Hard Rock Hotel and Casino. On September 6, 1970, her last entry in the nurse's logbook was around 1.50 a.m. and she disappeared not long after. It's assumed she was abducted and murdered, but no trace of her body has ever been found. Her abandoned car was found parked at her apartment complex. She didn't drive to work that morning as she had plans to ride home with a friend, so it's likely she was abducted from or around work. The following day, an unknown male allegedly placed some suspicious calls to Lass's landlord and employer to inform them that she would not be returning because of a family emergency. Lass's family denied there ever being a family emergency, and this man was never identified. Keep this disappearance in mind. 
the Zodiac wasn't heard from for several more months until the Chronicle received a postcard postmarked October 5th, 1970. This time, not handwritten, but instead using letter clips from an edition of the Chronicle. The postcard said, the pace isn't any slower. In fact, it's just one big 13th. A news reporter named Paul Avery was addressed by the Zodiac when the Chronicle received a Halloween card postmarked for October 27, 1970. Part of the letter said, Peekaboo, you're doomed, from your secret pal. He spelled Avery's name wrong, writing Averly, and the number 14 was written, referring to his current victim count. Avery was quite shaken up that he was really the first person singled out by the Zodiac by name and began carrying a gun he was permitted to carry. His fellow reporters even started wearing buttons that said, I am not Avery, which is like, come on guys. Soon after this, Avery received an anonymous letter that pointed out the similarities between the Zodiac's killings and the murder of an 18-year-old college student named Sherry Jo Bates near Riverside City College in Riverside, California back in 1966. In 1966 would have been four years prior to when this postcard was received and two years prior to the Zodiac's first attack. This was the last communication from the Zodiac until the following year in 1971. Choosing a different news outlet this time, the LA Times received a letter postmarked for March 13, 1971. In this letter, the Zodiac claimed responsibility for the unsolved murder of Sherry Jo Bates. Born on February 4, 1948 in Omaha, Nebraska, to parents Joseph and Irene Bates, she was the younger of their two children. The family moved to California in 1957, and after graduating high school, 18-year-old Bates became a student at Riverside City College. Bates' parents became worried about her when she didn't return home on October 30th, 1966 from her college's library after she left a note at their home letting her father know where she was going to be. Her badly beaten and stabbed corpse was found the next day on the college grounds by a groundskeeper. The supposed killer of Bates mailed nearly identical type letters titled The Confession on November 29, 1966 to the Riverside Police and the Riverside Press Enterprise. The author was able to provide details of the crime that were not yet released to the public, thus increasing the likelihood that this was indeed her killer. The author warned that Bates, quote, is not the first and she will not be the last, end quote. Because of this similarity, some believe that this was the Zodiac's doing. In his latest letter to the LA Times, the Zodiac praised police for making the connection to his Riverside activity, but he said, quote, they are only finding the easy ones. There are a hell of a lot more down there, end quote. Paul Avery and the Riverside Police Department don't believe the Zodiac killed Bates, but they also don't rule out the possibility that some or all of the letters received in relation to her murder may have been the Zodiac's doing, basically trying to take some false credit for something he didn't do. In a postcard sent to the Chronicles, Paul, quote, Averly, <laughs> he didn't even get his name right, why was that funny to me? It was postmarked for March 22nd, 1971. It appears that the Zodiac was taking credit for the disappearance of Donna Lass. The postcard featured an advertisement for a condo project in Lake Tahoe, Nevada, with the phrases, quote, past Lake Tahoe areas, end quote, and, quote, saw victim 12, end quote. The case remained cold, but it took investigators all the way to New York a couple years later when the Albany Times Union received a letter postmarked August 1st, 1973, possibly from the Zodiac. The writer threatened to kill again on August 10th at 5 p.m. during the shift change at Albany Medical Center. It includes a cipher that FBI cryptanalysis revealed to say, Albany Medical Center, this is only the beginning. Investigators weren't able to later find any murders that correlated to that August day, and some handwriting experts don't even consider it to be the work of the Zodiac. Honestly, most information about this case, from what I was reading, it, a lot of it carries a wide range of opinions. In a letter sent to the Chronicle, postmarked for January 29th of 1974, the Zodiac alluded to suicide with a quote from a musical, and he claimed that his victim count was now at 37. He threatened to, quote, do something nasty, end quote, if he didn't see the note published in the paper. 
y'all i don't even believe this man was killing at this point anymore like it seems like after a certain point he was really just like trying to keep his name alive by any means necessary just trying to keep the police engaged with him in any way he could the last communication received that is definitively attributed to the zodiac was to the chronicle postmark may 8th 1974. now i say definitively because there are quite a few there are simply speculations he complained of the apparent glorification of violence because of ads for the movie Batland that were going around at this time, which was a movie loosely based around the real-life murder spree of a man named Charles Starkweather and his girlfriend Carly Ann Fugate. As I said earlier, there are many opinions that come along with this case, especially who the Zodiac even is. That being said, I'm going to focus more on the investigation and prime suspects now. So in the first part, I talked about the Zodiac's murders, possible victims, and the letters he sent out. As a result of this highly publicized case, there have been numerous, and I mean numerous, suspects. There has yet to be any evidence directly linking anyone to the case, but the next few suspects I'll discuss are a few main suspects that were named based on alleged confessions, witness identifications, and a whole lot of other circumstantial evidence. A man named Arthur Lee Allen emerged as a possible suspect during the beginning days of the Zodiac investigation, but this was advanced when Robert Graysmith released his book Zodiac. He would be the subject of investigations and several search warrants over the years, yet all that was discovered was circumstantial evidence. Allen was born on December 18, 1933 in Honolulu, but grew up in Vallejo, California. He graduated from Vallejo High School in 1950 and received an Associate of Arts degree from Vallejo College in 1957. He was dishonorably discharged from the Navy one year later in 1958. From 1966 to 1968, he was employed as a teacher at Valley Springs Elementary School. The two evaluations he received, I, I'm just assuming they were annually because there were two. Not that that matters that much, but they marked multiple of his performance skills as either satisfactory or very satisfactory. So it seems like on a work level, at least, he was doing well. But wait a second, there's more. By the way, this was on a scale from unsatisfactory, need to improve, satisfactory, very satisfactory, to outstanding. So he either got like right in the middle or doing pretty well. His employment was short-lived because he was forced to resign after molesting students. During the time of his employment, he took only one sick day on November 1st, 1966. Now, this would have been two days after the murder of Sherry Jo Bates on October 30th. Following his termination in 1968, he moved back in with his parents who, according to family and friends, he didn't have the best relationship with and surely I'm, I'm just assuming him being fired for child molestation didn't help. The situation led him to start gaining weight and drinking heavily. Allen began working at a gas station shortly after his termination from the elementary school but he was eventually fired from there too. Similar themes from his last job seemed to pop up because his former employer came out to say two years later that he fired Allen for being undependable with a drinking problem and too interested in small girls. In December of 1967 or 1968, Alan's mother gifted him a Zodiac watch. And when I say Zodiac watch, it's like it was a watch with the cross circle symbol of the Zodiac on it. The year he supposedly received it in, um, it varies depending on which source you look at because according to Alan's brother, Ron, Alan actually received the gift the year prior in 1967. But if it was in 1968, that would have been the same month and year of the first attack on Lake Herman Road. If he did receive it that month, maybe that's how he came up with the symbol to begin with, if he even is a Zodiac. Speaking of Lake Herman Road too, Alan lived in Vallejo, which was not far from Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs, the latter being the location of the second attack. Serial killers often operate in areas they're familiar with. Now, despite the watch obviously carrying a negative connotation by this time, Allen continued to wear it. Shortly after the Zodiac's second attack on July 4th, 1969, um, just to remind you, in which Darlene Farron was murdered, her sister Linda came forward with some interesting information. Linda says that there was a man named Lee that Darlene had some sort of relationship with. Lee 
would often bring her gifts from Tijuana. Lee was actually a nickname that Alan was known to go by with that being his middle name. He also allegedly told someone that knew him that he was fond of a waitress that worked at the same restaurant that Darlene did. Alan's father, Ethan, passed away on March 17th, 1971, at age 67. This was looked at with suspicion when Alan later began being investigated because that would have been Darlene's 24th birthday. Almost two weeks after the Zodiac's third attack at Lake Berryessa, Alan was questioned by Detective John Lynch on October 6, 1969. It's unknown who turned Alan in as a suspect or why, but he was questioned about the murder of Cecilia Shepard at Lake Berryessa. Alan told police he had planned to go to Lake Berryessa on the day of the attacks, but he decided to go up to the coast instead. He also admitted to possessing bloody knives on the day of the attack, but said he had used them to kill chickens. If you'll recall, those were the only two that were stabbed rather than shot. From 1970 to 1974, Alan attended Sonoma State College where he completed a bachelor's degree. During this time, no murders attributed to the Zodiac occurred, but the Sonoma co-ed killings did begin. Alan's trailer was right at the center of these murders. The killer also used ties that were similar to the ones the Zodiac used during the Lake Berryessa attack. These are just a few more murders that are suspected to be the doing of the Zodiac. Alan would start being more heavily investigated after the Los Angeles Times printed a story on July 14th, 1971, detailing a brutal machete murder that took place on a California campground. Investigators said it was a possibility that the killer was the Zodiac. On July 15th, 1971, the Manhattan Beach Police Department were contacted by Santo Paul Pantarella, who was a business partner of Donald Cheney. Pantarella and Cheney went to college with Alan's brother, Ron, and knew Alan for approximately 10 years. Pantarella said that he and Cheney, the latter being who spent more time around Alan, had suspicions of him, and the recent murder only brought that suspicion to a focus. When Cheney spoke to investigators, he alleged that Alan said some rather interesting things to him that pointed toward him being the Zodiac. Cheney alleges that Alan asked him if he ever thought of hunting people while they were out hunting one time. Alan allegedly went on to describe how he would go to a lover's lane, much like Lake Herman Road, and use a revolver or pistol with a flashlight attached to randomly shoot people. He would then send letters to the police to throw them off, signing notes with Zodiac. They described him as a very intelligent but emotional man. They said he had a great hatred for women, including his mother, who constantly scolded his 220 to 250 pound weight. Cheney said it wasn't until months later when he read a quote from the Zodiac in the newspaper of a threat to shoot out the tires of a school bus and kill the children inside that he remembered Alan allegedly said he would do the same thing. Based on this, a report was prepared four days later by the Manhattan Beach Police Department for Inspector Toshi from the San Francisco Police Department. On July 27th, investigators from various police departments met to discuss Alan as a potential suspect. Dave Toshi and Bill Armstrong of the San Francisco Police Department, along with Special Agent Mel Nikolai from California's Criminal Identification and Investigation, or CII, traveled to Vallejo to meet Sergeant Jack Mullinax of the Vallejo Police Department. Hope you got all that. They decided to gather more information on Alan before they were going to make contact with him. After this meeting, Mullinex began investigating Alan immediately. At the beginning of his search, Mullinex discovered multiple incidences in which Alan was either a victim or a witness to a crime. He was also able to obtain numerous samples of Alan's handwriting from an anonymous source. He did not find the report from two years prior in which Sergeant Lynch questioned Alan two weeks after the Lake Berryessa attack. Although describing him as an honest and efficient worker, a former employer of Alan said he showed too much interest in small children. And as you guys can see, this was not the first time and it wasn't the last. About six weeks prior, Alan took one of the man's daughters on a boat without this man's knowledge. During this, he allegedly made inappropriate advances toward her. 
they decided not to report it and hadn't seen Allen since the incident. Mullinex reported to other investigators that Allen had an excellent reputation with his neighbors and according to them was very devoted to his mother. Mullinex, Toshi, and Armstrong visited a job in Pino, California where Allen had been employed as a junior chemist summer of that year. When his alleged Zodiac comments to Cheney were brought up, Allen stated that he did not recall having that conversation. He told police that he briefly followed the Zodiac investigation in newspapers, but he had stopped because it was just too morbid. Allen also brought up being questioned by Sergeant Lynch after the Lake Berryessa attack. He says he spoke to a neighbor at approximately 4 p.m., which was a detail he didn't tell Lynch. This being because he forgot. He says he didn't tell him because this neighbor had died approximately a week after he was questioned, and he just didn't want to bother with recontacting the police. Allen had been in Southern California around the time of the Riverside murder, which was a piece of information that Allen volunteered himself without prompting from Mullinex or any of the investigators, really. Allen did admit to having an interest in guns, but claimed that he only owned 22 calibers. Allen informed investigators about a book he read in high school that made a lasting impression on him, The Most Dangerous Game. Actually, quite similar to the hunting discussion he allegedly he had with Cheney, the book is about a man on a shipwreck island being hunted by another man like an animal. Allen's inappropriate demeanor towards children was brought up again after Toshi and Mullinex contacted a former employer of Allen, Ted Kidder, who Allen worked for as a lifeguard. Kidder said he received numerous complaints from parents regarding Allen's various acts towards their children. He, like Allen's other employer, did not report his behavior to the police. What is wrong with these people? Like, yo, one time is enough. The fact that you kept getting multiple reports and none of y'all was like mm, maybe i should do something about this like what is going on up there he told police that he and the general supervisor philip tucker had discussed their suspicions of allen being the zodiac three weeks prior due to his interest in small children and resemblance to the zodiac sketch tucker told kidder he had a casual conversation with allen about the zodiac case on one occasion tucker alleges that allen had discussed a special light attached to a gun barrel so that a person could shoot more accurately. Tucker also described another situation at Allen's home in which Allen showed Tucker and his wife an odd piece of paper taken from a gray metal box in Allen's room. It was said to have come from a patient at the Atascadero State Hospital where the person was committed for molesting a child. In this rambling note in which the patient claimed to have been betrayed by his attorney, it has symbols similar to those used by the Zodiac. Tucker's wife showed keen interest in the paper and asked to borrow it to study because at this time she was in school for, I believe, psychology. Allen declined and said offering to print a copy, to which he never did. Tucker contradicted Allen's claims of only owning 22 caliber guns, saying he had one revolver and the other was some type of automatic. When asked if Allen owned a 1965 or 66 Brown Corvair, Tucker replied in the negative but added that he himself owned a brown 1964 Corvair. He denied ever loaning the car to Allen, but said that he could have gained access to it in summer of 1969. While staying in Berkeley, Tucker left his Corvair, one of his two cars, at a service station Allen was working at. He couldn't recall the exact time the car was left, but he did know that he left the keys inside because he was attempting to sell it at this time. Tucker revealed that he terminated his association with Allen after an intervention arranged at the request of Allen's sister-in-law, Karen Allen. Karen wanted Tucker's help in convincing Allen to seek psychiatric treatment after receiving complaints from the family of another child Allen allegedly had involvement with. After being called down to a police station and being informed of why, Karen admitted that Allen was inappropriate with children, but she didn't believe he could be the Zodiac. And honestly, when I was reading, going through this, that's what I was pretty much thinking too. Like, he definitely has some issues and definitely should probably, probably be in jail for his behavior with children. I mean, it's one thing to be a pedophile and a whole nother thing to be a murderer. And of course, neither are okay, but looking at the crimes of the Zodiac, first of all, they were all pretty, I mean, obviously they were still kids, but they were older, on the older side of teenagers. And secondly, there was no type of assault of anyone at the crime scenes. Like, 
they were just straight killed and that was that so i just don't really think he is either karen did reiterate previous statements about alan being a man who hated women and had a strained relationship with his mother now strain might be putting it a little lightly her words were that arthur hated his mother and had often expressed this hatred in her presence Karen says that Alan pretty much received like top-notch treatment from his mother, from cooking to washing his clothes, cleaning up after him, giving him money. She even paid for two cars and two boats for him. But Karen also said that Alan resented her and had made threats against her as he thought that she was coming between him and her husband, her husband being Alan's brother, Ron. When asked to look at notes written by the Zodiac, she didn't recognize the handwriting as being similar to Alan's, but she did note that there were certain phrases included that he would say. For example, one of the notes written by the Zodiac had Mary Xmas spelled with two S's at the end of Miss. This being something Alan had also done in a Christmas card she received from him. Investigators learned about Alan's ambidextrous ability, meaning he could write with both hands, which was of interest to investigators. Maybe they wondered if he could be switching hands to write the Zodiac letters if he was the Zodiac. The next time investigators met with Karen was at her home with her husband, Ronald Allen, a then landscape engineer. Although Ronald was more than willing to assist with the investigation, he couldn't believe his brother was a serious suspect. Upon hearing about the alleged incriminating statements his brother had made to Cheney, Ronald described Cheney and Panzarella as responsible people who would not make such claims if they weren't true. He also informed investigators about a complaint he received from Cheney in which Allen allegedly made inappropriate advances towards one of his children. Ronald told investigators his brother, quote, drank to excess and had a definite problem as far as children were concerned. Ronald said he had no knowledge of the notes Tucker claimed that Allen showed him, but he did confirm that Allen had a gray metal box in his bedroom and owned two 22 caliber revolvers. In August of 1971, Mullinex paid a visit to the owner of the Argo service station in Vallejo, where Alan was briefly employed following his termination as a school teacher. It was during this interview he revealed his reason for firing Alan, the drinking problem and interest in small girls like I mentioned earlier. The owner confirmed Tucker did leave his Corvair at the service station, but he didn't think it was for a two week period. When investigators went to interview Mrs. Tucker in her home, she told Mullinex she was interested in the note because, oh yeah, she was preparing for a psychology exam at the time. When Mullinex showed her symbols from the Zodiac notes, she identified the symbols as being similar to those in the note Alan showed her. Mr. Tucker later arrived to his home and he too recognized the symbols as appearing the same as those in this patient note. Mullinex finished his report, but investigators didn't have any hard evidence linking Alan to the Zodiac crimes, nor did they have good enough handwriting samples for comparison. They needed more, so they turned to Ronald. Without enough evidence to obtain a search warrant of Alan's room, Ronald decided to go on his own, and he apparently found cryptogram type material, but he wasn't sure if it was related to the Zodiac. Investigators knew they would need to obtain a search warrant for the multiple trailers Alan owned throughout the Bay Area. It was here they believed they might find evidence as he was the only one to use them. Inspectors Armstrong and Toshi traveled to Allen's trailer at Sunset Trailer Park in Santa Rosa after investigators successfully obtained a search warrant. During the search, Allen arrived where he was instructed to copy text of a Zodiac letter, one with each of his hands. Allen denied ever killing anyone and willingly obeyed with the investigators' demands. His prints were taken by a San Francisco Police Department fingerprint expert, Robert Daggett, to compare the prints found at the scene of Paul Stein's murder. Investigators left the trailer exactly where they started when they entered it, with no evidence linking Allen to any of the crimes. All they found were a freezer of dead squirrels, which Allen had permission from the state to experiment on with his degree in biology. The document examiner for the state of California determined handwriting did not match any of the letters. They were also unable to match his fingerprints to the one found. Since handwriting analysis is not an exact science and investigators considered the fingerprint shaky anyways, they didn't let it deter them from Allen as a suspect. They kept an open mind about him 
ending the investigation until any possible further evidence came about. Allen's problem with children eventually caught up to him when he was arrested in October of 1974 for assaulting a young boy. He was required to serve out his sentence at the Atascadero State Hospital after subsequently being convicted. It was during this time investigators from the Sonoma County Sheriff's Office investigated Allen's possible connection with the Sonoma co-ed murders. Although there was circumstantial evidence linking Allen to the crimes as I mentioned earlier, there was also stark differences between these murders and those of the Zodiac. For example, the Sonoma killers stripped and dumped their victims while the Zodiac did the exact opposite, left his victims clothed and at the scene. Further investigation was unable to link Allen to any of these murders. The California Department of Justice was investigating Allen at this time, but for any connection as a Zodiac, and they decided to go down a different route. Agent Jim Silver asked Allen to take a polygraph test, and he agreed. After a 10-hour long test, it was determined that he was telling the truth when asked about any involvement in the Zodiac and Santa Rosa murders. Despite his criminal background involving children and suspicions of him being a serial killer, he was able to find employment as a fleet mechanic in January of 1978. This was after his release in August of 1977. Robert Gray Smith released his bestseller Zodiac in 1986 using a pseudonym Bob Hall Star for a Zodiac suspect. The star suspect matched Allen in many ways and many linked him to the book. The investigation into Allen was stalled until December of 1990 when a 50-year-old career criminal named Ralph Spinelli was looking at up to 30 years for nine armed robberies. He said he would be willing to reveal the name of the Zodiac if he could get some type of deal. His conditions were absolutely outrageous being that he wanted all his charges dropped for up to nine armed robberies. Sir, like, what were you thinking? The two interviewing him, Captain Roy Conway and Detective George Boward, didn't agree to this and pressed him for the name anyways. The Vallejo Police Department retained Boward on a contract type basis to do any follow-ups relating to the Zodiac case following his retirement in 1989. Spinelli doesn't tell them the name, but he says that this individual told him he was going to kill a cab driver in San Francisco and then the Zodiac took credit for it. So. He's saying someone told him that the killing happened. He put two and two together. After Spinelli directed any further communication to be done with his lawyer, Craig Kennedy, Kennedy finally gave investigators Allen's name in January of 1991. Yet again, Allen was the subject of someone claiming they told him he was going to commit one of the murders before doing it. Detective Bauer met with San Francisco Police Department Homicide Inspector Bill Armstrong and discussed Allen as a suspect. Despite the evidence on Allen's side, Armstrong said he was the most viable suspect he and Toshi had come across. Detective Bauer and Captain Conway determined Spinelli had to have had personal contact with Allen after being told it was only known to law enforcement that he was a suspect. Now this wasn't exactly true as Allen's name began being more publicly linked to the Zodiac case following the release of Gray Smith's book. Allen himself had also told people that he was a suspect. Vallejo police were granted another search warrant of Allen's home in February of 1991. He now lived alone as his mother had passed two years prior, so both his mom and his dad had passed by this time. The search turned over multiple news clippings related to the Zodiac case and a typewriter that was the same type used to send a letter to the Riverside police from Sherry Bates' killer, supposed killer I should say. They found a stash of multiple weapons, which at this time he now was not allowed to own due to his criminal background. Investigators decided not to arrest him, but the search put his name in further spotlight after an article was published by the Napa Sentinel identifying him by name. Allen came forward months later in August of 1991 to express his frustration in an interview to the Fairfield Daily Republic. He said he was consulting with attorney Martin Belly. The same attorney Zodiac had written a letter to in December of 1969. Investigators were being pressured to find evidence nailing Allen as the Zodiac, but they were unable to do so. Detective Bauer located Majo in August of 1992, where he picked Allen out of a lineup saying, that's him, he's the man who shot me, with the certainty of eight on a level of one out of 10. 
He also identified another picture as the possible Zodiac. There were also some other problems. Majo's original description didn't match Allen's, and he had been abusing drugs for many years by this point. After many years, Allen agreed to give another polygraph, which he would never get to complete as he passed from health complication at age 58 in August of 1992. In 2002, the San Francisco police were able to get a partial DNA profile from the saliva from the stamps and envelopes used for the Zodiac letters. This was compared to the DNA of both Allen and Cheney, neither being a positive match. Another suspect emerged in 2008 by the name of Richard Gajkowski, a filmmaker and journalist working for the Good Times during the murders. He was named a suspect by Tom Voigt of ZodiacKiller.com, the only Zodiac website officially recognized by law enforcement. Voigt gathered his information on Gajkowski from an informant known as Goldcatcher. Goldcatcher met Gajkowski in 1969 and eventually began to suspect him of being the Zodiac Killer. Richard Gajkowski, a.k.a. Dick Geik, was born in Watertown, South Dakota on March 14, 1936. He attended Webster High School and eventually graduated from Northern State Teachers College in Aberdeen, South Dakota. Gajkowski served in the Army during the 1950s, but not much is known about his military career, as most of the records were destroyed in a fire. Before Darlene Farron was murdered, she was living in Albany, New York after getting married in January of 1966. Gajkowski soon followed and even worked at the rival newspaper business of her husband in the same building named the Good Times Newspaper. In the letter Albany Times Union received in August of 1973, as I mentioned, a reference to Albany Medical Center was made. Wednesday was known as Production Day for the Good Times newspaper, in which the staff worked from the very early hours of the morning to very late at night. Now, between the Zodiac's first letter in July of 1969 until the Good Times closure in 1973, each one of the letters was mailed on every single day of the week except Wednesdays. Boyd reported on his website that the switchboard for the Good Times was located only yards from Paul Stein's residence. Speculation about Paul Stein possibly being a chosen victim arose from this. Stein was murdered on October 11th on San Francisco's Washington Street. Gajkowski had a cousin that lived on Washington Street with the birthday on October 11th. Claims about the switchboard have been disputed after it was discovered to actually be the Height Ashburn switchboard, not the Good Times switchboard. Although the Good Times encouraged the community to donate to it, this means that it was being ran as a completely separate entity. Gajkowski often shortened his last name to multiple forms, one of them being Geik, spelled G-Y-K-E. Interestingly enough, that same spelling can be found in one of the Zodiac's three-part cipher. The Zodiac only wrote one letter to the Vallejo Times Herald, which is where Gajkowski's best friend Bob happened to be working at the same time. The Zodiac didn't write any letters for almost three years, which coincided with Gajkowski's involuntary commitment to the Napa State Hospital in March of 1971 after he apparently, quote, went berserk. The 911 dispatcher that spoke to the Zodiac, Nancy Slover, identified Gajkowski's voice as the man she spoke with during an episode of the History Channel series, Mystery Quest. The issue was, by this time, she had not only already heard his voice, but she also previously stated two other voices were similar to that of the Zodiac. When asked if she could identify a hypothetical fourth voice, she said, I don't know, I'd have to hear the voice. So, she identified his voice, but it doesn't sound like she was all that positive. Paul Stein's sister, Carol, also made claims of recognizing Gajkowski, except from Paul's funeral. Goldcatcher had been making claims against Gajkowski since the 80s, but his credibility was questionable. With a history of bizarre behavior and making wild claims, San Francisco Police Inspector Mike Baloney reportedly described this Goldcatcher as one of his top three kooks. Those close to Gajkowski did not believe he could be the Zodiac, nor did they believe Goldcatcher's stories about him. Inconsistencies within his stories have also been pointed out by others over the years. In 1986, investigators from Napa County Sheriff's Department did some investigating into Gajkowski after some urging from Goldcatcher and Pam Huckabee, who was Darlene's sister. Gajkowski was put under surveillance for a few days, which exposed absolutely nothing. The California Department of Justice did, however, determine that his handwriting had consistencies 
with the Zodiacs. After obtaining further samples, they were determined to actually not be a match. The investigation into Gajkowski ended after no evidence warranted pursuing it any further. In the 1970s, a third suspect came about when an Escalon, California police officer named Harvey Hines decided to start his own investigation into the Zodiac. After interviewing some people that knew Donna Lash from the Lake Tahoe disappearance, they identified a man named Larry Kane as someone who knew or bothered Lash before her disappearance. Lawrence Klein, aka Larry Kane, was born in April of 1924 in Brooklyn, New York. He went to school up until high school where he chose to drop out in order to pursue employment. Despite his apparent lack of education, he passed the Eddie test, which is a very rigorous test designed for a highly classified military training program. They test applicants' math and physics, creativity, reasoning, and general aptitude abilities, and only about 15% of people pass this test. His extensive criminal background dated back to the 40s with a lot of charges surrounding fraud, theft, but also assault. He mostly stayed out of trouble after the late 60s with two more arrests until 1980. He suffered a brain injury from a car accident in 1962, which left him without the ability to control his impulses for self-gratification. He would be put under the radar as the Zodiac after multiple questionable eyewitness identifications. One story posted online by an anonymous supposed witness claimed to have seen Kane at the Lake Berryessa scene. They also claimed that the victims, this was when Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were attacked, were swimming, which was not true. Although this source claims they told the police this account, no documents of this can be found nor can it be verified. Kathleen Johns was abducted in March of 1970, where she soon after told police the Zodiac sketch resembled the man who abducted her. She came forward in 1992 and identified Kane as the man who had abducted her over two decades prior. There have been some doubts regarding this identification though. Firstly, it had been so long since her abduction that some wondered if she could have been mistaken. Skeptics also have doubts about whether the Zodiac falsely took credit for John's abduction to begin with. Don Fuke was the only surviving officer who had seen the suspect that was walking near the scene of Paul Stein's murder back in 1969. Harvey Hines made contact with Fuke in 1988 to discuss Kane as a suspect. After being shown a picture of Kane, Fuke told Hines the best he could give him is a good maybe, adding that too much time had passed for a positive identification. His latter statement was seemingly confirmed when he was later interviewed and did not recall meeting Hines nor being shown Kane's picture. During a 1994 interview by writer Ryder McDowell, Brian Hartnell said Kane's speech pattern sounded similar to the Zodiac's. McDowell wrote that Hartnell said he would never forget the Zodiac's voice, but Hartnell said it was a possibility he could during an interview five years later. He never officially identified Kane's voice as being that of the Zodiacs. Those closely associated with Darlene Farron had some interesting information to share eight years after her murder. According to Farron's babysitter and her two sisters, Pam and Linda, Darlene had a stalker. Now one has to wonder why they didn't come forward with this information for so long, but this is what they had to say. According to the babysitter, Darlene allegedly told her a man had been following her a man the babysitter claims to have even seen once, and that Darlene had seen him kill someone. Police investigated this further and found out about a man who allegedly spent many hours at the restaurant where Darlene worked as a waitress. A highway patrol man, Steve Baldino, identified a William Joseph Grant from a lineup as a man he had seen talking to Darlene at her job. During a TV interview, Baldino also claimed to have listened to an audio recording of the Zodiac's phone call to Vallejo police. This was disputed by Nancy Slover, the 911 dispatcher that answered, who confirmed the calls have never been recorded as they didn't even have the necessary technology at that time. Darlene's sister, Linda, apparently made three different identification for Darlene's supposed stalker. Both she and Pam first identified Grant as the supposed stalker. Then, Voight claims Linda sent him a letter saying Arthur Lee Allen had been stalking Darlene. Lastly, Harvey High notes that she also identified Larry Kane as the suspect. Included in this report is Pam's identification of Larry Kane. 
Pam supposedly informed Hines that she already identified William Joseph Grant as the stalker, saying both he and Kane looked very familiar. Sandy Betts, who was a family friend of the Farrens, claimed she was also being stalked and receiving calls from a man claiming to be the Zodiac. Darlene's family allegedly identified this man as Darlene's stalker from a picture taken by Betts, and this man was not Larry Kane. Richard Gajkowski's determined accuser, Goldcatcher, alleges he sent pictures of Gajkowski to Pam, and she positively identified Gajkowski as the stalker. This would mean that Pam identified four different men as the stalker, Gajkowski, Kane, Grant, and the man from this Sandy Betts picture. All in all, really the only person who can maybe be considered a credible witness identifying Kane is Kathleen Johns. Fingerprint testing further excluded Kane in 1991 after testing done by the FBI did not positively identify his fingerprints to those suspected to be the Zodiacs. Kane passed away on May 20th, 2010 in Reno, Nevada. One of the three remaining ciphers to be solved, the 340 cipher, was decoded by a team in December of 2002, 51 years after it was sent. It read, I hope you are having lots of fun in trying to catch me. That wasn't me on the TV show. Which brings up a point about me. I am not afraid of the gas chamber because it will send me to paradise all the sooner because I now have enough slaves to work for me, where everyone else has nothing when they reach paradise, so they are afraid of death. I am not afraid because I know that my new life is. Life will be an easy one in paradise, death." End quote. It did not, however, reveal the Zodiac's name, but there are two left to be solved. More recently, in 2021, a group that goes by the name of the Casebreakers claimed a man named Gary Francis Post was the man responsible for terrorizing the state of California. He passed in 2018, but these claims were disputed by the FBI, thus this case actually officially remains open. Now this is as far as I'm going to go into the suspects as they were the most prominent, but as you'll notice they've also mostly been excluded. I share this case with the intention of hopefully reaching the right person that can help get it solved and if you are that person you can contact the Vallejo Police Department at 1-800-488-9383 and that's also going to be in the description. You can also anonymously contact the Solano Crime Stoppers at 707-644-STOP for a cash reward that leads to any arrest for violent or serious crimes. If you like this video, you can go ahead and let me know with a thumbs up and you can hit the subscribe button to stay updated with my future videos. If you do have any cases you'd like me to cover, you can go ahead and leave that in the comments below. Thank you so much if you stuck with me all the way until the end. And if you haven't seen my last video on the disappearance of Madeleine McCain, you can click above to do so or check the link in my description. Stay tuned for my next video where I will be discussing the Oakland County child killer. Bye y'all!